The problem with the Dominion is that they are often written extremely benign, while dialogue indicates a nefarious nature. It even could be argued that the Dominion are more than happy to let you live your life and even help you be comfortable, if you're willing to exist in a gilded cage. In a move that I'm sure will upset my American audience, let's discuss how the Dominion's totalitarian state was pretty amicable. Before we get too deep into this examination of internal Dominion politics, it should go without saying, and yet here I still have to say it because people won't get it if I don't, that all of this goodness comes at the end of a gun with little concern for well-being or loss of life. There was very little empathy if someone stepped even barely out of line. Freedom of speech, indeed freedom of thought, was outlawed. If the Dominion said jump, you and your government asked how high. So now, let me blow your minds and discuss how people so bad can actually be good for the common man. I know, it's crazy. To be fair, we don't know the complete breakdown of internal politics in regards to the member states of the Dominion. However, examining episodes that break down how these states are treated within the Gamma Quadrant, as well as those under the tender mercies of the Vorta and the Alpha Quadrant, it shows that it's not the worst life you could have. Though, a caveat worth pointing out for the Alpha Quadrant is that we know the Dominion was being exceptionally careful in how they operated so they could show the other powers, such as the Romulans, Tholians, and Breen, that they weren't going to be brutal dictators. You could argue that some of this might have been for show, but I have my doubts. When we see the member states in the Gamma Quadrant, we learn that the Dominion will either negotiate with favorable terms via the Vorta, or utilize the Jem'Hadar to conquer new territories. Once under Dominion rule, the infrastructure will be modified so that the client state assists the Dominion in what it needs. This is generally through advanced technology, whether it be for ships, sensors, warp systems, or even weapons, whatever the Dominion was asking for. Once integrated, the client state is welcome to an expansive economy and able to trade as well as work with other member states within the Dominion. The state itself would be restricted from dealing with other entities outside of the Dominion infrastructure, however. So it's basically the European Union. Like, exactly. The European Union is a real-life Dominion, is what I'm saying. From everything I can tell in all of my research, it would appear that citizens are largely allowed to do whatever they want as long as they assist the Dominion when asked and play nice with the other member states. Wars, not being conducive for the internal politics of the Dominion, appear to be outlawed and all states are required to play nice with each other. That's not to say that different governments can't limit the abilities of their neighbors, even barring them from certain activities. Indeed, we see this with the Cardassians and the Bajorans. It's just that one side cannot deny the other certain rights or freedom of movement. The overall goal of the Dominion is to prevent rebellion or attack upon the Founders. To this end, as we discussed, they use the carrot and the stick. Due to this, it seems likely, and indeed we have on-screen evidence, that the Dominion will provide and prop up struggling governments to get them back on their feet, at least to a degree. But what does it look like to the civilians in their day-to-day? -day? We'll have to take a look at that after this. Hey guys, so a bit over a month ago, I was eating at a Waffle House, because I'm fat, and I happened to run into Matt and Melinda. Both of them were selling their wares because they wanted to raise money to adopt. It's a dream they've had for a while, and after some thought, I offered to give them a shout out and include their link in the description below. To be clear, this is completely unpaid, I'm just all for people who want to adopt kids. Helping kids get the love that they need. So if you want to get your good person deed out of the way for today, go ahead and click in the link below and consider donating to their GoFundMe. Generally, these videos get roughly 10 to 30,000 views. If half of you guys gave $1, they'd be well on their way. Another good reason is that if you donate, it makes you better than me and thus able to say I'm wrong on anything specifically said in this episode. And don't you want to do that? Except for the EU. It, it is the Dominion. That's just fact.
When analyzing civilian life under the Founders, we mainly have the Alpha Quadrant to understand their modus operandi. And again, this may be a bit skewed, but the change from Starfleet protection to Dominion oppression is barely noticed to most civilians. They're still able to trade, even between the Federation and Dominion, we see that transports still go back and forth. Initially, we see no troops on Bajor, and to my knowledge, there are only ever Vorta that are placed on the planet. There are no ghettos or internment camps like we saw with the Cardassians. There even seems to be some freedom of the press. We know that Jake is able to write about the Dominion here. Weyoun, while not willing to send it to the Federation, does seem tolerant of the fact that he keeps stating that the Dominion are being overly oppressive, when on paper the Dominion are just allies. Now, we do know that Jake had special protections due to being kin to Space Jesus Sisko, but I still think it's worth noting that there was some tolerance. It's possible, however unlikely, that the Dominion would have completely changed after winning the war, I just don't seem to think so because we don't see this occur in the Gamma Quadrant. I find it unlikely. What's intriguing is how seductive the Dominion is to the Alpha Quadrant as well. Jim Hadar keep the peace, everyone plays together nicely, and the Dominion ensures no other member states hurts the other. Beyond that, everyone's allowed to do whatever they want. In fact, we even see Kira accepting the idea at one point, not questioning it anymore. And still, there would be resistance. The ability to speak your mind, to want to be free, is apparently very strong. I guess the Telosians would say that Bajorans and other races have a lot of human in them. People would protest via speeches, and some of them would be taken away, sometimes forever, and it would escalate with others killing themselves to make a point. The Dominion, from the civilian's point of view, wanted to offer normality and safety, but it would come at the cost of your thoughts. Your soul, even. The Cardassian people had been saved, they were given food and their infrastructure fixed. The Bajorans could now peacefully coexist with the Cardassians, whether the Cardassians liked that or not. However, a gilded cage has never been something people enjoy or would stand for a long time. And most would forsake this and want conflict to be able to express themselves, as we'll see in the episodes to come. But what do you guys think? From a civilian side, any civilian side alone, was there any negative impact? Let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to rate and subscribe, and I'll see you guys on the next. Lore Reloaded.